Is that you? This man is an imposter, I tell you. Thanks, Tom. It's a great honor to be here. I was actually going to make a joke about the photograph that I sent for you to put up, which um, was 10 years old, but I can't make it anymore. So, um, I think I don't need to, I, I was going to start by making an argument for why uh, peace and reunification are necessary and good, but I think with this audience, I don't need to do that. Uh, peace, reconciliation, and the eventual reunification of the rival Koreas is clearly desirable. If you've seen that uh, photograph, uh, the satellite photo of the Korean Peninsula where all these lights are blazing in South Korea and blazing in China, and then there's pitch black in between with a few spots of light, like Pyongyang and one or two other places that look like lights on the rocks in a lighthouse in the sea. Well, I think peace reunification will turn those lights on. Uh, it would also uh, end the uh, terrible suffering of the North Koreans, as we know, and would heal the broken identity of all Koreans. So if anyone tells you it's not a good idea, then uh, there are a few thoughts for you to throw back at them. Uh, and as uh, Chairman Timulsina said from uh, Kathmandu, uh, it would be good for regional peace and prosperity. Uh, indeed, and I think one or two speakers have said this, that uh, peace and reunification on the Korean Peninsula will have a global impact because we expect uh, reunified Korea in some way to make the world a better place. So, what is to be done? Uh, Charlie Hurt said when he was talking, very humbly said, he's not sure. Um, Kyra Phillips made one or two points, uh, and I think I sort of fall in the same camp of, here's one or two points, but also I'm not sure. But I'd like to give you some thoughts. Reunification, first of all, reunification, I would suggest to you, should not be our vision. I think it should be our strategy or one of the strategies to achieve the vision. Uh, and rolling up the, uh, the barbed wire along the DMZ may happen rapidly, like the fall of the Berlin Wall, or it may be in slow motion, like the EU came together slowly. But reunification itself will be a process leading to an end. Um, and so what is that end? To figure that out, we need to ask, what type of state do reunified Koreans, the Korean people, what kind of state do they want to live in? Uh, what are its most important non-negotiable characteristics? In my opinion, uh, aside from the political explanations, peaceful, cooperative reunification has not happened here for 70 years for one simple reason, the absence of shared values. The values, the things that are most important in North Korea uh, which underlie the functioning of their political, economic, and social uh, institutions are the values of race-based nationalism and devotion to a strong leader. South Korea, on the other hand, as you know well, um, is a modern democracy. Its people value freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of assembly. They value free and fair elections, equality, fairness, justice, and all those things we associate with democracy. So our vision for a reunified Korea, I would say, must be developed with these democratic values in mind. What we want is a democratic, free market, reunified Korea set in the context of a democratic, free, free market, Northeast Asia. So 
I'm not going to go off on this tangent, but what I'm saying is we want China to become a democracy as well. Nothing less, frankly, is acceptable. So what is the strategy, uh, what are the strategies to get us there? Um, the North Korean leadership fears absorption by the South, or perhaps it's motivated by a desire or, or, or a delusion that it can still take over the South. Um, it may have both of these thoughts in its mind at the same time. But it, I, can, I assure you it has no interest in reconciliation. Uh, Kyra Phillips talked about this earlier. Its strategy for as long as it is weaker than South Korea, which it is, is to blow hot and cold, to take one step forward and one step back, all the time building its weaponry. It doesn't matter. I, I don't think it makes any difference uh, who the president is in the United States or who the president is in South Korea. Uh, that is the situation we're dealing with in North Korea. Given this impasse and mindful of our vision, uh, I say that our side must use every opportunity to nudge North Korea and China as well in that direction of democracy. Second point, I believe that we are over-obsessed with the North Korean leader. Let's face it, he's not going to have an accident and fall off his horse, um, have a near-death experience with his grandfather, and then wake up in the hospital as a liberal Democrat or conservative Republican, whichever uh, you prefer. Um, he might, but I don't think we should count on that. So beyond the, the, the diplomatic, I'm not saying be unpleasant to North Korea or rude, beyond the diplomatic courtesies, however, the approach to unification, I've, I think, right now, should not be to curry favor with him or try to manipulate him. I think we should be thinking, how can we bypass him? So as the politics is stuck, I recommend that we focus on the emotional underpinning and build trust. Look for ways to build trust. And that means addressing two things, I think. One, addressing North Korean fears and building bonds. So what are these fears that must be addressed? Consider this. Um, many of you here are Koreans. Um, I think a lot of you uh, overseas folk are familiar with Korea. But I don't know if you know this. We had demo we've had democracy here since 1987. Of the first five democratically elected presidents in South Korea, two were jailed after their terms. Each term, by the way, a single term, five years. Two were jailed. Two avoided prosecution, but their children were jailed. One committed suicide to forestall a corruption investigation. The sixth president, was impeached and given a 30-year jail sentence and was pardoned a few weeks ago after five years. We have a vicious political culture here. And we have a floppy system of justice that bends under pressure. I'm serious. Let's wait and see what happens to President Moon. I'm not predicting anything, but uh, wait and see what happens to President Moon. But my point is, if you're observing all of this from north of the border, Kim Jong-un and the North Korean elite is looking at this, and then here we come, UPF, and say, oh, we want to talk about uh, reunification. He's going to say, you, you're kidding me, right? You think I am going to unify with these people? No. So I recommend, in addressing this, that UPF, here's a thought for you, Tom, I recommend that UPF propose that South Korea pass a law committing future governments to no retribution. And I think we should champion a post-reunification truth and reconciliation process for justice and for healing and to ensure that, and also we should try and ensure somehow that a future reunified Korean government doesn't backslide on such a commitment. 
Now, I have to be honest, I think the Koreans here will agree with me, Koreans are not very good at doing this. They tried a few years ago uh, to deal with uh, alleged co collaboration with Japanese imperialism and, and atrocities committed under dictatorships, and they failed. So they'll need help. So I think there's a role here for our friends in Cambodia and in South Africa and other countries that have an experience of how to do this. Another point, I think, uh, regarding the, the, the focus on the emotion that I mentioned uh, is building ties. Right now, uh, South, North and South Korea are not families. They're not brothers and sisters. They're enemies. If North Korea takes over tomorrow, I bet you, certainly me, my friend Jacko over here, who's lived in Korea for a long time, and all the Koreans here with our families will be on the ferry to Japan immediately. They're not going to be very nice to us. So the first step is to move from being enemies to becoming neighbors. This emotional process can be approached and has been approached. I'm sort of overstating this just to make this point. It has been approached through culture and sports and other forms of engagement. I think the South Korean government, which controls things very much, needs to lighten up and let activists and artists be more free in their dealings with the North and indeed in their expression. Right now, there's a there was a law passed recently that hasn't been tested yet, but it kind of makes it a crime to criticize North Korea, which is a, an odd thing in South Korea. But you need, you need to have some measure of freedom here. I think we need to let modern culture, not just K-pop and Korean movies, but also international culture, influence the people of North Korea, just as the Beatles and, and the Rolling Stones and everybody influenced the Soviet communists. Uh, a generation ago, and I think there's a role here for international society. Final point, uh, I think we need to be bold. Um, last week, uh, in preparation for this meeting, uh, I read the autobiography of Reverend Moon, the founder of UPF. It's been sitting on my shelf for about 10 years, and I hadn't read it, and so I thought, oh, I'm going to read this. Uh, and I recommend it. It's a very, very uh, good, very moving read. But in it, he describes how he asked the political scientist, Morton Kaplan, in, I think it's 1984 or 85, to put together a conference that would declare the end of Soviet communism. Now, Professor Kaplan wanted to sort of um, kind of moderate this a little bit to make it softer, but Reverend Moon was insistent on, uh, on this. And I guess as the conference was his idea and he was paying for it, he got his way. And so Professor Kaplan went out and declared the end of communism uh, a bit early. I think everybody looked and thought, hmm, that's a bit odd. Um, I think Reverend Moon, well, he says in his autobiography, he had a kind of an instinct uh, that it was coming to an end. 70 years was enough. It's enough time for communism to be undone and worn out from within by its untruths and by its failings. But um, he could have been wrong on that. Uh, but his argument was very interesting, and it was this. Uh, it was that a declaration itself uh, has its own energy to bring forth its message. For example, you, you probably had this experience. If you're, if you're down and depressed and things aren't working for you, uh, in, and you're making one mistake after another, the solution is not to say, I'm a hopeless loser. Even though you are, uh, the, the solution is not to say, I'm a loser. This, it's much better to de declare, I'm better than this, and I will be great. And then the change begins there and then. So, so it's in that sense that declarations uh, function. They're not really objective truths. They're more ways to redirect energy, if you like. Um, well, it's been over 70 years that the two careers have been divided. Their sister, and I'm talking to you as somebody who in 1990 
predicted reunification in 1992. So I'm a very, very bad uh, prophet. Um, and their system may not have run out of steam yet because I don't think the North Koreans are really communists. They're not intellectual Marxist-Leninists. Um, and they're very, very stubborn people. But I think its system will run out of steam in time. And I recommend, a further recommendation for UPF is to consider making a bold declaration to move things along in this way. And to leave you with one final thought, and I'm aware I'm taking too much time, I'm sorry. To leave you with one final thought, I recommend that you hold your next World Summit in Pyongyang and make the declaration there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.